Hello, chemists and biochemists. In this video, what I'd like to talk to you about are a class of enzymes that are relevant to DNA. These enzymes are known as restriction endonucleases, or somewhat commonly known as restriction enzymes. All right, so restriction enzymes are a class of enzymes that they basically fall into a total of three different categories. And those categories are largely based on whether or not they require ATP and if they have a specific sequence that they're looking for. So if you think about a piece of double-stranded DNA or DS DNA, you'll have something that I'm going to I'm going to draw basically as a, a very simple cartoon rendering of it. Here's our double-stranded DNA. Now, of course, these uh, vertical lines correspond to um, base pairing and hydrogen bond between those base pairing or the hydrogen bonds between those base pairings. So if you look at one strand as having an A, G, C, T, A, G, for example, then you know the opposite strand is going to have C, T, A, G, C, T. Okay. Now, there are, are enzymes that what they will do is they'll basically scan a piece of DNA, a piece of double-stranded DNA, and they are going to look for a specific sequence. Now, restriction endonucleases or restriction enzymes are those enzymes. Now, what's kind of cool about them is what they will do is they're going to break a covalent bond. Now, that covalent bond that they're going to break may or may not have long-term consequences. Um, so if we took a restriction on a nucleus like ECOR1, so this is maybe one of the, the most common restriction endonucleases. And one of the reasons for that is that this is a restriction endonuclease that's purified from E. coli. And basically every restriction endonuclease is going to give you a little bit of an insight into the organism that it came from because of the first three letters in that name, E-C-O. Well, that's E-C-O. From e, coli, or from e. coli, from Escherichia coli. So this R1 is going to span to derive from, well, it was the first restriction enzyme found in E. coli. So what that kind of implies is that there's also E. coli R2, E. coli R3. You're absolutely right, there are. Now, what a restriction endonuclease is going to do, in addition to potentially requiring ATP or not require ATP, is it's going to fall into a couple of different categories based on the restriction patterns. So if we took a e uh, restriction in your nucleus like ECOR1, it's going to have a specific sequence that it's looking for. For example, some restriction in your nucleuses, if they see a pattern like GATC, what that means is that they're looking for a piece of DNA a double-stranded DNA that basically looks like this. Now, there are two major categories for restriction endonucleases and the patterns and the um, products that they generate. They're either going to generate a blunt-ended fragment or a sticky ended fragment or ended product. Now, a blunt ended product is going to take a restriction sequence like this, and it's going to cut right here. And the result that you're going to get is GACT, a double strand piece of DNA, and another end of a double stranded piece of DNA. Okay. So in this, in the case of a blunt-ended fragment, all that you have, or all that you're cutting, are covalent bonds. And covalent bonds only, or you could say only covalent bonds, break. Now, another 
example would be, let's say you have this long double strand piece of DNA and there's something like GAATTC. Then the other strand of it, oh, and this continues on down here. Well, the reverse complementary sequence is going to be C, T, T, A, A, G. Well, for, and I, I'm just using these sequences uh, kind of randomly. Um, these are just examples. Well, some restriction endonucleases, what they're going to do is they'll see a pattern and maybe they'll cut between the G and the A on one strand of DNA. So what that means is they're going to cut on the G and the A on the opposite strand of DNA. So in this case, you've got two cut sites, two covalent bonds that are going to be broken, but these covalent bonds are not directly across from one another. They're staggered. And so what that means is, well, a covalent bond still exists between these A's, between A and T, between T and T, between T and C. And then same thing down here, all of these covalent bonds still exist. But this one right here, it's kind of tough to see right there, but between the G and the A, and between the G and the A, those, those covalent bonds have been broken. Now what that's going to do is that molecule will ultimately kind of be destabilized. And I always kind of think about it like, imagine you have a suspension bridge and you cut at either end of this suspension bridge. Well, you still have the roadway. The roadway would be your, like your hydrogen bonds. So there's still hydrogen bonds here, 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 between your nitrogenous bases. But keep in mind, this is taking place in an aqueous environment, an aqueous environment where hydrogen bonding is going to take place. So although you have hydrogen bonding that's stabilizing this double-stranded piece of DNA, it's ultimately not strong enough to keep this molecule intact. And so the products that you're going to get are going to look a little bit like this. You've cut between the G and the A. And so on one piece of DNA, you're going to have this end right here. So one strand, the G is the last nitrogenous base. Well, the opposite, you have C, then you have T, T, A, A. Because remember, here, you still have covalent bonds that are holding these nucleotides together. What that means is that you're going to get a second product that looks like this. A, A, T, T, C, G. Strand goes on, strand goes on. So you have these double-stranded pieces of DNA where basically you have what's known as an overhang. So you have nucleotides or nitrogenous bases that can hydrogen bond with the environment again, which is leaving behind these overhang regions. Those overhang regions are basically able to hydrogen bond with anything in the environment. But that's your fundamental difference between your types of your two types of restriction endonucleases. You have the blunt ended product and you have a sticky ended product. Restriction endonucleases will cut and generate either blunt ends or sticky ends. The way that I always like to think about it is I like to think about the bonds that are, are being broken. In both cases, you have covalent bonds that are broken directly by the restriction and new nucleus. But the positioning of those covalent bonds matters. If those covalent bonds are directly across from one another, well, then that's fine. Only the covalent bonds are going to be broken. If those covalent bonds are staggered from one another, then the outcome of that is going to lead to um, breakage of hydrogen bonds. So staggered covalent bonds will lead to fallout that leads to uh, hydrogen bonds also being broken. So those are, are pretty much your biggest considerations when it comes to products. Now, another thing to think about with respect to these restriction endonucleases is how frequently a cut site will be recognized. So if you have 
let's imagine the enzyme that is looking for a restriction sequence that looks like this, A, A, T, T. What that is looking for is that's looking for a sequence that is four base pairs long. So it's got A, A, T, T, A, A. So it's looking for four base pairs long. Now, in a randomly generated piece of DNA, what are the chances that in the first position you would have an A? Well, it's one out of four. In the second position, what are the chances that you'd have an A? It's again, one out of four. In the third position, what are the chances that you would have a T? One out of four. In the fourth position, what are the chances that you have a T? It's one out of four. So what this leads to is, and the question that basically is being asked is, in a randomly generated piece of DNA, what are the chances that you would have a sequence that is AATT? More or less, how frequently are you going to find AATT in a randomly generated piece of DNA? Well, all that you need to do is multiply these fractions by one another. One out of four times one out of four is one out of 16. One out of four times one out of four, one out of 16. So then that would be one out of 256. So what are the chances that you find a specific four nucleotide piece of DNA or a specific sequence that is four nucleotides? That's one out of 256. Now, the longer that that recognition sequence is, the less frequently that you're going to find in a randomly generated piece of DNA. So if we talk about something that's, you know, six base pairs long, what are you going to find more often? AATT or GAC and CAG? Well, you're going to find this AATT more frequently than you would find GACCAG. That GACCAG, you're going to find basically once every 4,096 base pairs. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful for looking at and considering the difference between the bonds that are broken by restriction endonucleases directly and then those bonds that are broken kind of indirectly. In addition to that, thinking about the, the terminology, blunt end versus a sticky end. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful and I hope you have a good one.